Have you ever wondered about sex in the animal kingdom or about the role adaptation plays in reproductive behaviors? In this lecture, we'll explore the diversity of reproductive biology and sex in the animal kingdom. We'll cover topics including asexual and sexual reproduction and sexual behaviors in different animal groups, including some of the weirdest yet most fascinating sexual behaviors in the animal kingdom. Asexual reproduction is producing progeny with only one parent and without any specialized sexual organs. This means that individual animals leave clones behind. These animals are genetically identical to their parents, except in rare cases of genetic mutation. Amoebas and some other single-celled organisms reproduce through asexual reproduction, like binary fission, which means equal cell division, or budding, which means unequal cell division. Binary fission only occurs in single-celled organisms like bacteria and protozoa, not in higher animals. Budding occurs in single-celled organisms like yeast, as well as some plants and a small number of aquatic animals, such as the hydra. But there are other forms of asexual reproduction in animals that are more complex. For example, the little mangrove killifish in Florida, which is unique because it's the only self-fertilizing hermaphroditic vertebrate. The mangrove killifish is a kind of bizarre Western Atlantic marine species. Their range overlaps the distribution of the red mangrove. And this fish occurs from central Florida and the United States to southern Brazil. This two inch long fish typically lives in brackish water in the upper reaches of mangrove forests. It may wriggle out of the water and inhabit crab burrows, small ephemeral pools, and even logs with fish apartments made by insects. The vast majority of killifish develop ovaries first and then testes and produce both ova and sperm as adults. A typical hermaphrodite is an animal that has both male and female reproductive organs in the same individual. Thus, these creatures can potentially mate with every individual they meet from the same species. But unlike most hermaphrodites, these particular hermaphrodites are not able to mate with other hermaphrodite killifish. So instead, they self-fertilize. They create genetically identical individuals within each self-fertilizing lineage. These are otherwise known as natural clones. Recently, some true males have been discovered in some populations. There is molecular evidence that these males sexually reproduce with the hermaphrodites, thereby adding some diversity to the killifish gene pool. The interesting thing about the killifish is it's not a traditional hermaphrodite. For one thing, most hermaphrodites in the animal kingdom are invertebrates. There are only a couple of hermaphrodites among thousands of species of insects, but there are many hermaphroditic worms. Earthworms, for instance, are simultaneous hermaphrodites. Every individual earthworm carries both male and female reproductive parts at the same time. As many fishermen know, worm reproduction takes place on the surface of the ground at night. The sexual organs are contained in worm segments nine through 15, and when the worms couple, they line up sperm receiving segments with the appropriate sperm seg sending segments for appropriate sperm transfer during this mutual mating. After copulation, each worm lays its own eggs and uses the stored sperm to fertilize those eggs in a cocoon where they develop and eventually hatch as miniature replicas of their parents. The young creatures develop their own reproductive parts in about 60 to 90 days and reach full size at about one year of age. This type of hermaphroditism is much more common than self-fertilization. And as you can guess, it adds a bit more genetic diversity to a population. Another method of reproduction without any males is through parthenogenesis. This is a modified form of sexual reproduction for which males and females are present in the population, but females can develop unfertilized gametes or eggs into living offspring without a contribution from the male. Some people think of this kind of asexual reproduction as a virgin birth. 
This form of reproduction happens in bees, wasps, some lizards, and other animals that we consider not as complex as birds and mammals. And there are several types of parthenogenesis in the animal kingdom. As you probably learned back in high school biology, eggs and sperm are formed by the process of meiosis. Without going into too much depth, it's important to remember that while in mitosis, which is ordinary cell division, all the chromosomes in the cell's nucleus are doubled, and then the cell splits in two. But in meiosis, the chromosomes are doubled, and then the cell splits in four, single copy, double division. The result is each of the four cells, the gametes, that's the general name for eggs and sperm, each has one set of chromosomes instead of two, like the rest of the cells in your body. We call cells with only one set of chromosomes haploid. If they have two, they're diploid. Why does this matter for parthenogenesis? Well, in sexual reproduction, an egg and sperm fuse and restore the diploid state. You've got half your mother's DNA and half your father's DNA. Two sets of chromosomes fuse and your cells become diploid. But in parthenogenesis, we only have eggs and eggs are haploid. So how does this work? The short answer, it's complicated. But let's get into the long answer. In one form of parthenogenesis, known as amiotic or diploid parthenogenesis, females are capable of producing diploid eggs. That's amiotic without meiosis. So in amiotic parthenogenesis, females produce offspring by spontaneously activating a diploid egg, which is followed by normal embryonic development. In these cases, the mother's chromosomal complement is wholly passed on to her offspring, so the offspring can be considered her clones. In honeybees, we have something different. We have something called haplodiploidy. And like the name, it gets pretty complex. In fact, it's a combination of parthenogenesis and sexual reproduction. In honeybees, we have proper meiotic egg production and proper meiotic parthenogenesis. A queen bee produces haploid eggs, but she has a couple of different ways she can handle them. First, she can lay unfertilized eggs. These eggs become haploid male offspring, which we call drones. They have one function in life, and that is to fertilize a queen's eggs. If the queen is carrying sperm from a drone, she can choose to fertilize some of the eggs she lays. The offspring that hatch from the fertilized eggs are female diploid bees, which become worker bees or new queens. And these aren't the only options for parthenogenesis. In fish, we sometimes have gynogenesis, when a diploid egg is hormonally stimulated to develop by the presence of sperm, even though the sperm don't contribute genetically to the offspring. In some insects and flatworms, sometimes haploidy spontaneously corrects itself and the offspring becomes diploid, even though it came from a haploid egg. Or two eggs will fuse to create a diploid individual a form of self-fertilization or autogamy. Oh, you have to wonder why an adaptation that is so complicated would appear in the animal kingdom at all. But like any adaptation, variants on parthenogenesis appear because they confer a survival advantage to a particular species in its particular environment. Asexual reproduction offers a species two big advantages and they're both about a population numbers game. The first is that if you're a self-fertilizing hermaphrodite or a parthenogenetic female, then you only need to produce one surviving baby per, per generation to ensure the survival of your species. In a sexually reproducing species, you need at least two individuals, one male and one female. The second reason is that single asexual individuals can reproduce more quickly than a member of a sexually reproducing species. Those honeybees we were discussing earlier, the queen can lay 2,000 eggs in one day and perhaps a million in her lifetime. The complex 
sexually reproducing mammals get nowhere near that rate. For zoologists like me, working in conservation practice, that means we can quickly replace more of a critically endangered asexually reproducing organism than we can a sexually reproducing one. The disadvantage, of course, is that there will be no genetic variation among the organism's descendants. This may be an advantage if the environment is stable and just right, but climate change is making environments less stable all over the world. As a result, asexually reproducing animals may be more susceptible to new diseases and changes in temperature than those that reproduce sexually. Because animals that sexually reproduce seem to have the upper hand adaptability-wise, that may be why the parthenogenetic form of reproduction is comparatively uncommon. Sexual reproduction is therefore an advantage when genetically robust reproduction is preferable to fast reproduction. In sexually reproducing organisms, there are two sexes, individual males and females in the species. Because there is at least some genetic variation between the two parents, the recombination of their genes creates variation between the parents and their offspring, and even between siblings. Remember that, unlike some of the parthenogenetically produced animals I just described, each of us is always genetically diploid. Each of our cells has two complete sets of chromosomes. And again, this happens because two haploid gametes, one egg and one sperm, fuse, forming diploid cells once again. The first of these cells following fertilization is called the zygote, and it's formed by the egg and sperm cell fusing. These diploid zygotes have copies of half of each person's, each parent's DNA, which allows a little extra diversity between individuals within each species. In addition to this, the process of meiosis, the process of creating gametes, fosters even more genetic variation through what we call independent assortment of traits. I'm going to use a simplified explanation for this. And I need you to think back to high school biology again for a bit. I want you to imagine a cat. This cat is carrying genes for fur color and eye color. Let's say that on chromosome pair one, the cat carries a gene for gray fur on one chromosome and for white fur on the other chromosome. Let's say also that this cat carries genes for eye color on chromosome pair two. The cat carries a gene for green eyes on one chromosome and for blue eyes on the other. So far, so good. Now, during meiosis, the cat's chromosomes line up in their little pairs and get ready to be separated. Let's say that when the first cell goes through meiosis, the gray fur chromosome and the green eye chromosome go into one gamete, and the white fur chromosome and the blue eye chromosome go into the other. But wait, and then another cell splits. But this time, the gray fur and the blue eyes end up in the same gamete, and the white fur and the green eyes end up in the other. The offspring created from those cells are not only different from their parent because they have only half the parent's genes. They're different from each other because they have different sets of their parent's genes. That's independent assortment. And it can actually happen on the gene level, not just the chromosome level, but you get the idea. This is why we say that sexual reproduction maximizes genetic diversity. That's how sexual reproduction works on the genetic level. But what about the forms it takes? Invertebrates engage in some of the most amazing forms of sexual reproduction. Reproduction that occurs outside the animal's bodies, especially among the marine invertebrates. So now, I'd like to introduce you to the first of the Smithsonian National Zoo guest experts you'll be meeting throughout the course. Today, you're going to meet Mike Henley, who is a PhD candidate at the University of Hawaii and a staff member of the Smithsonian Conservation Biology Institute, who is an expert in coral reproduction. Mike, thank you for taking the time to talk to us today. Can you tell us what makes corals so interesting when it comes to reproduction? Sure, yeah, absolutely. 
So corals reproduce in two ways. The asexual reproduction is uh, there's a couple different types, but mostly they uh, asexually reproduce through fragmentation, and that's as simple as breaking a branch. So sort of similar if you had a, a house plant and you could give a take a cutting and give it to a friend, that's asexual reproduction. I work on the other side, which is the sexual reproduction, and a lot of people don't know that corals do that too. Birds do it, bees do it, even corals do it. What they do is they produce egg and sperm, and most corals are hermaphrodites and that they produce egg and sperm simultaneously. Now, there are, of course, always differences in biology, and uh, some corals are only male and some corals are only female, and some corals that are only male or female are that one summer, and then they'll switch to that the next summer. That's always really interesting. But most of them are simultaneous, what we call simultaneous hermaphrodites, meaning they produce egg and sperm at the same time, and they will release that in usually what's called an egg sperm bundle. So you can think of it as a package with the eggs packed together, and in, in the middle of that is a, a packet of sperm. And they release that egg sperm bundle, and the eggs are usually full of lipids or fat, and of course that's going to be positively buoyant, so that means it floats up to the surface of the water where that bundle will then break apart. Uh, once when they break apart, the sperm's activated, starts swimming around to look for an egg. Hopefully it's going to find an egg of the same species of coral. And then they fertilize, and so then you have a fertilized egg or uh, basically a, an embryo, the beginnings of a new baby coral. And so this is what we study in our lab. Uh, we study the sexual reproduction of corals because while the asexual reproduction is good for reproducing the number of corals, it's not doesn't do anything for the genetic diversity of the population, which also, of course, matters. And so the sexual reproduction, just as in any other organism, is what helps keep the spreading of the genetic diversity of that population. Right. And of course, we're saying the sperm search for an egg, but that's not the way you and I search for our keys or something. It's a different biological mechanism. Yeah, that's one of the, the things I find fascinating about corals is that, you know, uh, on a biological level, corals do have a nervous system. It's, it's not a very extensive nervous system. They have no brain. There is a neural net. So these brainless animals have tuned their reproduction to the same hour or the same few days or the same month every single year. And that, that never ceases to, to amaze me when I sit back and think about it. They synchronously spawn, more or less, within a few minutes of, of one another, which is pretty incredible. And so different species are going to spawn different times of the night, potentially different times of the year. Most corals are tuning into several different environmental factors, the temperature of the water, the lunar cycle, and even the time of day uh, before sunset or after sunset or before sunrise. And if you're studying a particular species, you have to know what's triggering reproduction in order to study that reproductive process, right? So you really need to know when the species you're looking for is going to spawn because if you're in the water an hour or before or an hour after, you're likely to miss it. Now, so we have pretty good data on that. So you got to know which one you're looking for. Basically what you do is it depends on the, the type you're looking for. Here in Hawaii, we can actually bring some of the corals from the reef into our water tables and collect them, collect their uh, the egg sperm bundles or their egg or sperm just from them sitting in a bucket of water or uh, in, our, in, our, in our water table. Depending on your work, where you're working, for example, in the Caribbean, those corals we actually do have to dive for and we have to go and set a net over them. For those, we, we get in the water about a half hour, 45 minutes before spawning time and swim around to look and see if they're going to spawn because while we do know the day or days they might spawn, you know, sometimes they are a day or two off from what we would predict, so you have to get in the water just to check. And then we would set a net with a little collection cup on the top of that net, think of like a butterfly net with a little tube on the end of it, and then we wait for the corals to spawn. And so on the night where they are going to spawn, uh, you can see them doing a behavior of what we call setting. And that means you can see the individual coral polyp holding the bundle. Eventually, that little polyp is going to release that bundle, and you've got one, you have one polyp on a, on a coral colony that's going to release one bundle. But on, say, a colony that's the size of a car, you have hundreds of millions, perhaps, of individual coral polyps, all potentially releasing a bundle, and then how many colonies there are on the reef. That sounds like an incredible sight. But what do you do with the samples you collect? sperm bundles in, we will actually, we'll separate the egg, sper egg and sperm. And here's where, depending on your research question, you can do any number of different things. You can do 
a batch fertilization where you just mix everything together. If you want, if you're looking at individual colonies, see if there is an effect of one one genotype on another. You can do individual crosses. Again, that all depends on your research question. But prior to doing the fertilization is where a lot of our lab does the work, where we actually take the sperm and we will try to cryopreserve it, uh, freeze it in liquid nitrogen, and do a lot of our experiments on that end. But once once we have done the fertilization, then you've got to take care of the little juvenile corals, the little baby corals as they're developing. And they'll develop over the course of, again, depending on species, a day or two to maybe four or five days. And then they're going to go through a series of, of developmental phases till eventually they're a swimming, what we call a planula, or they're a swimming larva. Then, again, depending on your research question, you can look at how they, they're going to swim down and... At this point, they're probably going to make the most important decision a coral will ever make in its life, and that's where they're going to spend the rest of their life. So they swim down, and they will metamorphose or change into a, uh, a singular primary polyp, and this is one little baby coral. So if you take your index finger and thumb on, on both hands, put them together, and pinch down until you can barely see any light peeking through that tiny little hole you just made with your two index fingers and your two thumbs, all right, that's the size of one single coral polyp as it's trying to set up shop where it's going to live the rest of its life on the reef. And what's the overall aim of your work? So the work our, our lab uh, specifically is doing with cryopreservation is it's a piece of conversation that I think a lot of people might not know about or is often overlooked. So if you're, you, know, you have a species that's, that's declining and you want to save it from extinction, what can you do? Okay, well, you can protect the species, and by that, you know, you also got to protect the habitat. You can start the captive population, like a zoo or aquarium, so that you, you know, is that buffer against extinction, so you have that insurance population. And then cryopreservation is one piece that I think it is a conservation tool that a lot of people don't realize. So if you've lost too many of a certain species, you're down to, you know, 100 individuals of, of, a, of a given species. How can you save that from going extinct? Again, those, those pieces that I mentioned before, the captive population, the protection, the um, protecting their habitat. But also now you, if you're going through a, you know, that genetic bottleneck and too, too few individuals of, to have enough genetic diversity around, you can cryopreserve or freeze in liquid nitrogen um, their genome. I heard that you basically do all this cryopreservation in ordinary styrofoam boxes. Yeah, that's the beauty of it is that it's really low tech, but there's a styrofoam box, a small styrofoam box, just like you would ship something in, and a couple of pieces of foam material uh, in sort of an A-frame that looks like a little house with the, um, the cry, what we call cryo canes on, and that you put the, the vial in. So you have a, basically a one and a half, 1.5 mil vial that we push onto these cryo canes. We load those, those cryo vials with the, the sperm and the cryo protectant. And then that floats in the styrofoam box on the liquid nitrogen and drops the sperm at the appropriate freezing rate. Because if you freeze too fast or too slow, it doesn't, uh, it doesn't work. The sperm won't, won't live. And so the beauty of it is that this is meant to be, you know, you can carry this, this cryolab, quote unquote, in a small suitcase anywhere. Of course, the challenge is going to be that you have to get your hands on liquid nitrogen. But there are ways to actually produce liquid nitrogen that, that's, that are proving to be uh, portable and, and also cost-effective. So it's actually not a, a, this amazing high-tech lab that you would think ever see on TV. It's, it's meant to be a field-friendly methodology that's been developed. Well, that's pretty amazing. Mike, I wanted to thank you for discussing your work with us today. It's been a real treat. There's still much we don't understand about coral reproduction. Researchers like Mike continue looking for other factors that affect coral reproduction, such as a chemical component akin to a pheromone. They also continue to research the effects of ocean temperatures on the timing of coral spawning. One thing that these sexually reproducing corals have in common with many invertebrates is that they are producing more eggs, sperm, and larvae than will ever possibly settle and become adults. Broadcast spawners can release thousands or even millions of gametes, only a few of which will manage to achieve fertilization, and only a few of those will survive to become larvae, and only a few of those larvae will survive to become adults.
But there are also some more complex animals that have ended up with this quantity over quality strategy, the most famous of which is probably the salmon. We've all heard stories about salmon swimming upstream to spawn. Adult salmon swim from the ocean into their natal freshwater streams and rivers. After traveling through raging rapids and leaping over small waterfalls, males arrive at the shallow areas where females make their gravel nests called reds. During spawning, females eject their eggs into the red while the males eject their sperm into the water, fertilizing the eggs. Each female salmon lays thousands of eggs because the chance of survival is low. Another reproductive strategy is to produce fewer young, which are more capable of surviving to adulthood. Some invertebrates invertebrates have a spermatophore, or sperm capsule, that helps a male deliver sperm directly to a female in one way or another. The advantage of a spermatophore is that a male only needs to mate with a female once, and there is a relatively high chance that he is the father of that female's embryos. Some salamander species have developed precopulatory behaviors to entice the female to accept their spermatophore. Females, females can store sperm for some time in the reproductive tract. Therefore, salamanders can mate in the spring or fall, but lay eggs in late spring or early summer, the prime time for egg laying. The good news for the male is that as long as the female uses the sperm from his spermatophore, he is assured of his paternity of her offspring. An advance beyond the spermatophore is internal fertilization, in which the male needs to be in contact with the females. All reptiles have internal fertilization. In evolutionary time, amphibians remain dependent on their aquatic environment. Reptiles, however, began the evolutionary adaptations that allowed vertebrates to conquer the land. The way to conquer the land is with a watertight skin and a watertight egg. Once the animal leaves the water, the egg's environment remains internal to the female where it's warm and moist. And if the egg is internal, it needs internal fertilization by the male. But even among reptiles, there are a few species that give birth to live offspring what we call viviparous reproduction. Viviparous reproduction is common in environments that may be too cold or where the warm season is too short for optimal development of eggs. North American garter snake, banded water snake, and timber rattlesnakes that live in seasonally cold environments all give birth to live young that are ready to eat and act like miniature adults. This also occurs back in the ocean. Skates and rays internally fertilize eggs during sex, as do their relatives, the sharks. Internal fertilization is efficient, and it increases the likelihood of fertilization by reducing sperm wastage in the open water. It also protects the young, allows them to arrive in the world as miniature versions of their parents, and even allows the mother to select a new environment that is optimal for her offspring and allows her to move there prior to giving birth. Finally, internal development of offspring ensures that the energy-rich eggs produced by females are not eaten by predators, and that most of the energy spent by females on reproduction is passed to the embryos. While animals that give birth to live young are called viviparous, rays represent a third variation. They are ovoviviparous, which means that their embryos rely on substantial yolk within the egg during initial stages of development. After the yolk nutrients stored in the egg have been absorbed by the embryo, it ingests or absorbs an organically rich uterine milk called histotroph. This uterine milk is produced by the mother and secreted into her uterus. By comparison, many other bony fish lay eggs. The infant fish go through metamorphosis as they develop from embryo to larvae or fry and then onto the juvenile stage while the tiny creatures absorb the yolk sac. After the yolk sac is absorbed, the individual fish needs to be able to feed on its own. It would seem simpler to reproduce asexually, but apparently simple isn't the best answer since so many more species reproduce sexually. 
the advantage of the genetic diversity that results from sexual reproduction must outweigh the disadvantage of slower rate of reproduction. The disadvantage is that it takes members of both sexes to participate, and it may be difficult for the sexes to find one another, especially in reduced populations of endangered species. For animals that sexually reproduce, like humans and other primates, each female also needs to produce two surviving individuals, one male and one female per pair on average, to ensure population stability and survival of the species. If females have fewer than two children on average, the population will shrink. And if they have more than two, the population will grow, or it might explode. The fact is, there's no one perfect form of reproduction. A species environment, life cycle, population size, and many other factors affect the way a species has evolved to reproduce.